Hello, this is going to be a walkthrough for the slides that students in the Biology 139 lab at BCTC will need to know uh, for lab exam 2. Um, this lab exam is going to cover respiratory, digestive, and renal slides. Um, so let's start with respiratory and this slide is showing you a slightly magnified view of the trachea um, and this view you can see a couple of different layers um, this area right here that I'm indicating is towards the inside of the trachea and this side over here is the outside of the trachea so in this view you can see a couple of different things that you'll need to be able to identify this right here is hyaline cartilage and that forms the c-shaped rings that give uh, support structural support to the trachea and help keep the trachea from collapsing if there's much pressure applied um, these hyaline cartilage run about three quarter or maybe a little bit more than that around the trachea um, the rear, the posterior part of the trachea, the C-shaped cartilage rings don't meet. Uh, in the back, that's where the esophagus comes close to the trachea. And when you swallow food, you need to have uh, the ability for your esophagus to expand. So in the back of the trachea, in the posterior portion, these C-shaped rings do not connect. Um, a couple of other features that you may need to know. These open areas right here are called mucus glands, uh, mucosal glands, or uh, seromucosal glands. Um, they secrete some mucus, but I don't believe that you're really going to need to know their function there because we're going to look at something else on the next slide that handles more of the mucus production that you're interested in. So let's take the same slide and zoom in a little bit. All right, so this is the same slide, just at a higher magnification. Uh, here again, you can see some of those mucus glands or seromucus glands. And now we're going to be interested in this layer right here, which is the inner area of your trachea. Um, a couple of things of interest right here. This tissue type is called pseudostratified columnar epithelium. This is something that you saw in 137 when you were studying the different epithelial tissues. A couple of things of note here, just along the surface you can see kind of this hazy material. That is the cilia that lines most of your trachea and some cells scattered throughout this tissue layer that kind of look clear compared to the other darker purple cells. These clear cells are called goblet cells. Goblet cells are the ones that produce mucus that we're more concerned with. These goblet cells secrete mucus onto the inner surface of your trachea. And this mucus, uh, it, it helps to lubricate your trachea, but more importantly, it helps to catch any dust particles or anything that enters your trachea that shouldn't. And as it gets uh, filled up with this dust, the cilia kind of have this beating motion and move that mucus with all of the particles that is trapped upward so that you can cough it out. Interestingly, smokers, um, the longer you smoke, the more it damages the cilia. And eventually the cilia are worn completely away from smoking, um, which keeps you from being able to use that. It's called ciliary escalator. Uh, and what ends up happening is the mucus that is secreted will still catch particles, but you don't have the cilia to help move everything up. So you're reduced to coughing much harder and much more often to, to kind of fill in for the 
the action that the cilia would be taking. All right, so now let's move deeper into the rest of the lungs. Here we have a low magnification, uh, and most of what you see here, these open spaces, uh, are alveoli. These are the air sacs that fill with air when you inhale, uh, so they're constantly expanding and contracting with each breath. Um, a couple of things of note here that I don't believe you'll be asked but are interesting are here and there you'll see actual blood vessels. Um, some of these larger ones are arteries and arterioles, but if you look really closely, you can actually see a couple of capillaries that are responsible for where the actual CO2 and oxygen exchange takes place. Let's take this same slide and zoom in a little bit to see the structure to identify. Now, this is the same thing we were just looking at, but much more magnified. And these large open spaces are those alveoli that we were looking at. What you'll need to know here are the different cell types that we're going to look at. Here we see some very long, flat cells. Uh, think back to 137 and remember a single layer of very flat cells we call simple squamous epithelium or simple squamous epithelium. This is the cell type that allows for efficient diffusion. So these are the cell types that allow for efficiency of gas exchange. They're also called type 1 cells. And a couple of ways to identify them is, like I said, they're very, very flat. But another way is in the middle of each of them, there is a darker stained section that's the cell nucleus and the cell nucleus of simple squamous epithelial cells is kind of elongated. We'll compare that to something that's a little bit difficult to see here. If you're on my Facebook page at BioTutor Scott Space Davis, you can, can take this picture and zoom in. But right here at the tip of the pointer is a type 2 cell. This is simple cuboidal epithelium, and they're just kind of scattered throughout. And you can distinguish them uh, by looking at the nucleus. And the nucleus of these type 2 cells, simple cuboidal epithelial cells, is round. So here the nucleus is round as compared to elongated in the simple squamous epithelium. The type 2 cells they're responsible for secreting surfactant, which is another name for them, surfactant secreting cells or surfactant producing cells. These cells secrete surfactant, which is good for breaking up surface tension. Now, if you think back to 137, when we talked about water properties, one of the things that it did was create something called surface tension. This is why you're able to fill a glass with water and kind of mound that water up over the top because water likes to stick to itself. Well, these alveoli, with every breath, need to be able to expand and then contract. But we also need them to be moist um, since, since that's where the gas exchange takes place. And Anytime there's moisture in the body, it's a pretty good guess to say that it contains a lot of water. And as these alveoli relax and let the air out, that moisture likes to stick to itself, kind of creating almost like a shell around the alveolus. And when the alveolus tries to expand again, that surface tension would make it difficult. Surfactant reduces surface tension, allowing the alveolus to expand easily. So, type 1 cells, simple squamous epithelium, efficiency of gas exchange. Type 2 cells, or surfactant secreting cells, simple cuboidal epithelium, and they secrete surfactant, which reduces surface tension. Let's move on to the digestive system. This slide is one that really trips a lot of students up. 
This is the gastroesophageal junction. This is where the esophagus and the stomach meet. And in this view, it's really, really difficult to, to distinguish what you're looking at. So on the next couple of slides, we're gonna look in more magnification at this area and more magnification at this area so that you're able to distinguish what you're looking at. Right now, we're looking at what was the lower section of that previous slide. And if we look really closely at this folded up material right here, this tissue is actually made of many, many layers of kind of squashed up cells. These cells are called squamous cells, just like we looked at in the lung. But since there's so many layers, this tissue type is called stratified squamous epithelium. And think back again to 137, stratified squamous epithelium, the role of that, the, that tissue's function is to resist abrasion, to kind of act as a protecting layer. Well, what you're looking at here is the esophagus. And when you're swallowing food, that food kind of brushes against this tissue here, which scrapes away some of those cells. But it's okay because we've got many, many more layers of those cells underneath and they're constantly being replenished. So the esophagus is made of stratified squamous epithelium. Let's compare that to here, the stomach is kind of difficult to tell what tissue type this is at this magnification, but again, if you're on the Facebook page, you can take this picture and zoom in. But here we've got these kind of sunken in areas. These are called gastric pits. And these gastric pits are lined with simple cuboidal epithelium. I'm sorry, simple columnar epithelium. I apologize. Simple columnar epithelium is going to be responsible for making and secreting the acid and enzymes that digest the food in your stomach. So go to the Facebook page and in these gastric pits, zoom in and you can see that simple columnar epithelium. Now we've moved into the small intestine. This slide has a lot going on and we're gonna look at two different views of this same slide. Um, right now, we're looking at this area right here called the serosa. This is the external wall of the small intestine. When you are looking at the fetal pig and you see the small intestine, this area right here is what you're looking at. Up here in this region is the interior of the small intestine where the food passes through or the digested material uh, passes by. So let's look at from the outside inward and then once we get closer to the interior of the intestine, we'll look at it from another slide. Like we said, this material right here, this tissue, uh, is the external layer called the serosa. Just beneath the serosa is going to be some smooth muscle, and there's gonna be two different layers of smooth muscle. Here, running this way, is longitudinal smooth muscle. And it's continuous in this view because it runs the length of the intestine. Next, we've got these areas right here. Uh, I've had some students say that it kind of resembles bacon. Well, this area right here is the circular smooth muscle. The reason it looks like this is because rather than running the length of the intestine the way the longitudinal smooth muscle did, the circular smooth muscle runs around the circumference of the small intestine. So working together, the longitudinal smooth muscle 
shrinks the small intestine lengthwise and the circular smooth muscle uh, gives kind of a squeezing motion to the intestine. And those work in concert to move the digested food through the intestine. Now, if we move to where the tip of the pointer is lying, this layer is called the submucosa. And it kind of extends upward into these little finger-like projections that we will look at on the next slide. So all I'm going to do now is move to the next slide and we will look at this region up here that's kind of cut off. All right, so now we're on the innermost area of the intestines. And here we can still see that mucosa, I'm sorry, submucosa that we were looking at on the previous slide. And it is extending up into this finger-like projection right here. This projection is called a plique circularis. One of them is a plique circularis, multiple are plique circulae. And like we said, the submucosa extends up into that plique circularis. And at the tip is some darker staining tissue. This is lymphatic tissue, and we call that a Peyer's patch. Peyer's patch is responsible for, as the nutrients are absorbed from your meal, they pass into the small intestines, and there's potential for stuff that we don't want being absorbed. And lymphoid tissue here, the Peyer's patch, is essentially examining everything, making sure that we're not absorbing anything that could harm us. Now, coming off of this finger-like projection, this plique circularis, are smaller finger-like projections. These are called villi, and they just help kind of increase the surface area so that we can absorb more efficiently. And while our microscopes magnify everything nice for us. They don't magnify enough to see that on these villi, if we were to, to zoom in even more, we would see that there are even smaller projections, which are extensions of the cytoplasm, extensions of the membrane of the cell making them up we have microvilli, and that even further expands the surface area. Well, this area where the villi are is the mucosa, or the mucosal layer. So, mucosal layer composed of villi, submucosa is beneath the villi. Now we're going to move along to the renal system. We're looking now at the kidneys. A lot of what we see here in the background, there are these small circles or ovals. These are the kidney tubules. Um, most of the nephron that you're gonna be studying in lecture uh, is composed of tubules. And these tubules are made mostly of simple cuboidal epithelium. But the big prominent feature that we see here is made up of a couple of different parts. Um, and right here in the middle, at the tip of the pointer, is a special type of capillary called a glomerulus. This is where all the blood that's being filtered passes through and that filtration takes place. This open area around the glomerulus 
catches that liquid that's being produced called filtrate. And this shell is called Bowman's capsule. The glomerulus and Bowman's capsule together make something called a renal corpuscle. Now, this area right here that we're looking at on this slide contains both renal corpuscles and kidney tubules. Keep that in mind and let's go to the next slide and see a difference. This slide, except for over here on the edge where we see a renal corpuscle, is almost entirely made of kidney tubules. If you see kidney tubules, but no renal corpuscles, that tells us that we are in a deeper part of the kidney. This is the renal medulla compared to the previous slide, that was the renal cortex. The renal cortex contains renal corpuscles and kidney tubules. The renal medulla only contains renal tubules. This final slide, see if you can tell what we're looking at. Well, what we have here are lots and lots of rings of simple cuboidal epithelium. So these are tubules, renal tubules or kidney tubules. But what don't you see anywhere on this slide? You don't see renal corpuscles, no glomerulus, no Bowman's capsule. So that should tell us that this is a deeper part of the kidney. This is the renal medulla. That is something that you'll be needing to understand, something that you'll need to recognize for your second lab exam. I hope this all made sense. And like I always say, if you have questions, you all have my text, you all have my Facebook, uh, feel free to contact me at any time. Good luck on your exam.